I had a question. Uh, I'm currently I'm in the team sports setting and uh, working with the college sports team, and I guess in that setting it's a lot tougher to do like one-on-one -on -one ass assessments because you just don't really have the time to. In that case, if you did want to like like pattern the or we pattern or pattern breeding habits so that they avoid getting into these different positions. How what would be like the I guess the best way to do that if you're working in like a group um, setting? Do you do, you do warm up activities? Like, we integrate like ninety nine or um. No, I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm just talking about anything. Like, you mm -hmm. do any dynamic warm up activities, like moving yep. stuff. Yep, a bunch of those. Okay. Give me like a for instance. Give me three exercises. Uh, inchworm to frog. Say what now? Uh, it's called an inchworm to frog with, with integrated with the world's greatest stretch. Okay. All right. I, I think I got you. And then so, like, so, uh, like so they're walking up into kind of like a downward dog type of position. Mm -hmm. So they're in a downward dog position, and then they walk up the hands to a push up position, and they bring up one leg. We have one hip and then the twist engine? Yep, exactly. Okay, awesome. That's the main that's one of the main ones that we do. So, so all you need to do there, young man, is to sequence the breathing at the right time. Mm -hmm. And you got yourself a golden activity. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm in a push-up position, where would the, where would where would the, the path of least resistance, where do I want that path of least resistance to be in breathing from in a push-up position? You're in a push-up position, then. Yeah. Where's where's most of the muscle activity? On the front side of the body or the back side of the body? The front. Okay, cool. So then I can, probably can't get air there, right? So air will fall in the but back. But if I if I push hard enough and and I and I take a breath in that position, shouldn't I be able to expand the the posterior rib cage? Mm -hmm. Cool. That makes sense. Problem solved. Number one. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I walk up in the niche, I'm into that downward dog type position, right? Am I correct? Yep. Okay. So I'm inverted. Yes? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't I be able to breathe in that position too? Yes. So that's my arms overhead, which means that I have to fill the, the top part of the thorax, right? Mm -hmm. I, have, I have my guts resting on my diaphragm, which is going to help me into a position of exhalation, but I will assist with exhalation in that position. And then if I hit a breath from that position without allowing my, my belly to balloon out, does that not expand my rib cage in, in the, that posterior aspect as well? Yeah. When I got upper and I got posterior taken care of in, in that same exercise, right? Mm -hmm. Now I move into the world's greatest stretch. That's an asymmetrical pelvis. Am I correct? Yes. So I got one leg forward, one leg back. So I just created a twist in my pelvis. So I got one side of the pelvic diaphragm that's going to be elevated. I'm going to be have one side that's descended, correct? Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to twist the thorax, which means I'm going to fill up one side of the rib cage versus the other a whole lot better. So now I've just trained my pelvic diaphragm to, to exhale on one side and my thorax to fill up on the opposite side. Am I correct? So then each position is a new breath. And everything you needed to do with that one activity. All you got to do it. is do the breathing right. Got it. So each time they go into that position, it's, that's a new breath or breathing yeah. cycle. Exactly. Got exactly. it. Interesting. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. You don't have to be fancy. Mm. You, don't have to, you don't have to do, you know, any particular exercise. You just got to know where, where, where the airflow would be restricted under those circumstances, where it's not restricted, and where you want the air to go. And you can put the body in, in just about any position, and you can draw the airflow. So generally, then, air will be restricted where there's muscle activity that's restricting opening of the rib or expansion sure so do a side plank where's the muscle activity the side close to the ground or yeah so do you think you're going to get a bunch of air there no absolutely not where's it going to go it's going to go somewhere else right what if if i wanted to go up to the other side what do i have to do you could flip around no <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm in a left side plank uh -huh. I want the air to go to the right side. Oh, you just need to breathe. Okay, but what if it goes forward? Uh, then you could, I guess you can like hold your rib cage down with your abs. What if I just exhaled first, right? 
Hmm. And then I, did, I, I cue them to, to maintain that position. And if I breathe, where's the air going to go based, based on where the muscle activity is, right? It's yeah. going to go away from where the greatest muscle activity is. Got so it. it does. Yep. Right? Make sense? Hmm? Yeah. You already know the answers. You just haven't put, you haven't put it together with the breathing before. Mm -hmm. Piece of cake, my friend. <laughs> is there any specific way that you like to cue people to breathe? I know that I've seen videos of you using balloons. Yeah, the balloons help. But I mean, you don't need them. Some it's people, just... some people do great without them. Some people, some people need the extra um, uh, help with that. You know, as far as like learning how to control pressures, some people need the 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 oral component of it. Right, because they can't, they don't know how to breathe through their nose because they don't spend any time breathing through their nose, and so then that helps coordinate that as well. So there's a lot of there's a lot of benefits to that. So generally, then would it be in through the nose, out through the mouth, and like a, is there like a ratio inhale versus exhale duration? Yes, yeah, so you have to have exactly forty eight percent inhale and fifty percent fifty percent exhale. No, <laughs> <laughs> there's no way there's no way to measure that. There's no way to measure that. Do you do a longer exhale versus inhale? Or In, just... it, again, it depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're trying to, to quiet down muscle tone, that would, that would typically be the way to go. It, it, there's a concept called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the, the, the shift of your, your autonomic nervous system from sympathetic to parasympathetic. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's fight or fight or rest and digest. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you inhale, you become more sympathetic. Your heart rate variability goes down. Okay. And, and that's more of a stimulatory side of the autonomic nervous system. And then as you mm -hmm. exhale, you become more parasympathetic. Okay. And then mm -hmm. the heart rate variability increases. And that would tend to uh, reduce uh, uh, the excitatory component of the autonomic Right? So it depends on what I'm trying to do as to how I would want somebody to breathe. Right? Okay. So if I want to crank you up and I want to get you excited, probably don't want to be, you know, doing chill out type breathing. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if I want to Im improve your ability to move, it may behoove me to do some of that. Got it. Thanks, Bill. That, that was really helpful. Hope that helps. Uh, I'm gonna Man, there's a lot of stuff in it. That was awesome. <laughs> What's that? I just, I think it's really cool. It's a really cool illustration of it's like the concepts are simple. You know a lot of anatomy, so <laughs> you make it like it's simple in your head, right? But I think it illustrates that this is, I mean, that's why we talk about stuff like anatomy. It's because once you understand that, you can make your own breathing test. Right. But unfortunately, anatomy is learned out of context. And, and that's what makes it so hard to understand, right? But if I tell you, if I tell you that um, um, if I turn my rib cage to the right, um, my uh, inspiratory inter intercostals are more active on the side to which I'm turning. So if I turn my shoulders to the right, my inspiratory intercostals will become more active. So there's more expansion in that direction. That's just simple anatomy, right? But if I hit that, if I hit a breath now with, with, with right rotation relative to my pelvis, now I'm expanding this side of the rib cage. And that's, what, that's, that's how you learn anatomy. That's the best way to learn. So I could just say that, well, you know, your inspiratory intercostals are between, you know, the first through sixth ribs. And um, when you breathe in, they're more around the sternum here. And, but, but again, it's just like it's it's becomes rote memorization, and then that's boring, and then it doesn't stick. But if I tell you that this rotation occurs, and you get intercostals working on one side more than the other, and you can associate that with something, then obviously it's going to stick better. And that's that's how anatomy probably needs to be taught. And we we were talking about that today in the purple room, you know, because we always default back to anatomy, and and but if if you learn it in within a, a an a, an, a, an analogy or an association with something else, then it makes more sense. So if we talk about sprained ankles and it's like, okay, um, what if you sprain your ankle, you roll your ankle inwards into an inversion sprain and your toes are higher than your heel, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to, you're t you tend to sprain the, the posterior talofibular ligament more so than the anterior talofibular ligament, right? 
but most people sprain their, their ankles toes down. And so they sprain the one in the front, which is the anterior. But now, now you understand, you have a better understanding of what those ligaments restrain in regards to movement just by having that discussion versus these are the three ligaments on the outside of the ankle. They attach here, here, and here. And, and so that doesn't make much sense. So whenever you're trying to learn something, when you're trying to learn anything, we learn everything by association. Create a scenario under which, you know, if you're trying to learn anatomy, what's going on, you know, under these circumstances, you'll have a much better time trying to, to learn how the anatomy works and you won't have to just sit there and memorize attachments and positions and such. It, and it'll be much more meaningful to you if you can create an association. I love that. Read the, book, make it, read the book, Make It Stick. How about that? Read, make it stick. Is that by like, Heath Cummins? I, hang on. It is Make It Stick. No, not, uh, not Made to Stick. This is Make It Stick. It's uh, Peter Brown is one of the primary authors. Ooh. It's about learning. So, so it's, it's actually evidence-based learning. Who first discovered that? I know Jay was pimping that a couple of years ago. What, Make It Stick? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's good. I picked it up late. I don't, I don't know what took me so long. It's the best training book I've ever read. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, seriously, it's a training book. It's, it, it's, about, it's about learning, but, but I mean, you'll, you'll see everything to do with training if you read that book. How to program um, um, a micro cycle is in there if you pay attention to it. Um, how to organize a, a workout. Um, how to alter loading. Uh, it's all in there. It doesn't say that stuff, but if you if you read it from that perspective, you'll see it. Mm, I definitely got to check that one out. I recently picked up Fergus Connolly's book. That one's interesting too. Game Changers. Have you guys heard of that one? Hang on a second. Nope, never heard of it. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, so, you know, we, we've talked about c complex adaptive systems on Campo's uh, question, and, and he lays that part out for you, in, in that, that first eh, third of the book, maybe? I can't remember. Um, I'm, I'm halfway through it, maybe. Um, and I'm skipping around a little bit, too, because it's, it, it's a pretty good framework. I mean, obviously, it's a, it, he's done an excellent job. It's a, it's a great book to, to have. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, things that I'm, I'm sure his second book will fill in the gaps for people, but, but it's an excellent framework. 